Hello and welcome to the Point of Care podcast. This week's episode is on COPD exacerbation. As an introduction, an acute exacerbation is defined as a worsening of respiratory symptoms in a COPD patient necessitating further treatment. That being said, an acute exacerbation of COPD is a clinical diagnosis, and symptoms can include dyspnea, increased frequency and severity of the patient's cough, and increased volume or purulence of their sputum. 40% of COPD exacerbations are thought to be related to viral illnesses like rhinovirus. Since it's a clinical diagnosis, you need to be thinking about and ruling out other diagnoses like congestive heart failure, pneumonia, pneumothorax, and a pulmonary embolism. As a checklist, think about your EBCs. Look for evidence of respiratory failure or altered mental status that might require intubation. Also check an ABG or a VBG to see if there's worsening hypercarbia. As a chart check, look for the patient's home regimen, see about prior exacerbations, and whether or not they've needed to be intubated in the past. For admission criteria, if they have dyspnea, worsening hypoxia or hypercarbia, or they need IV medications, they should probably be treated in the hospital. Things that you can't miss include hypercarbic respiratory failure or a pulmonary embolism. When you're thinking about admission orders, certainly put the patient on a continuous pulse ox, telemetry, get an EKG, send a CBC, a BMP, a VBG, a vitamin D, get a chest x-ray, consider an RVP if you have a high suspicion that the viral illness led to the exacerbation, a Procal can be helpful if you're worried about a bacterial pneumonia. A trope and a BNP can help determine if there's any cardiac etiology or evidence of overload. And a CT chest can be considered if you're not sure of what's going on. And also make sure you clarify the patient's intubation preferences. Initial treatment to consider include duonebs, steroids, and antibiotics, which we'll talk more about later. For the HPI intake, ask the patient about their home meds and adherence. Ask them about issues with cost or access to their inhalers or other medications, which is unfortunately very common in the United States. Also ask about proper inhaler use and ask the patient to demonstrate how they're using their inhalers at some point during the admission. Get a sense of what the severity of their COPD is. Ask them about how often they're using their rescue inhalers and if they're having nighttime awakenings with coughing. For symptoms, ask about dyspnea, sputum, cough, URI symptoms and symptoms of congestive heart failure, like dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Ask again about prior exacerbations, prior intubations, and the red flags to be looking out for include altered mental status, retraction, nasal flaring, or difficulty speaking, all that can suggest increasing work of breathing or potentially worsening hypercarbia. As an assessment, think about all this history, including their home regimen, smoking, their prior exacerbations and innovations, and asking about sick contacts to see about whether this could be a viral illness. Clinically, be thinking about dyspnea, sputum, cough, their URI symptoms like sneezing, rhinorrhea, and headaches, and again, those congestive heart failure symptoms. On the exam, you should be noting that increased work of breathing like nasal flaring, retraction, tripoding, pursed lips, difficulty speaking, whether they're showing any cyanosis, tachypnea, or wheezing, whether they're altered, looking cachectic, and whether or not they have a volume exam suggesting that they're volume up. Also be looking out for DVT signs like asymmetric legs or erythema or pain that might suggest that the patient is clotting and could have a PE. Data that are important in making your assessment include a white count to suggest an underlying bacterial pneumonia, an RVP that might show you have a viral illness, a Procal, a VBG, and a chest x-ray. Things you should be thinking about in the differential include an infection, whether or not they're missing or just not able to access their home medications, changes in the weather, smoke exposures, and, other, and again, be thinking about ruling out CHF, pneumonia, pneumothorax, and PEs. For the treatment, the first and foremost, you should be thinking about getting the patient on oxygen. Comment on what they're currently on, how you're going to monitor them, and what your goal titration is to. Classically, in COPD, we think about 88 to 92% but we'll talk more about that later. Also be thinking about the bronchodilators. In general, treating with duonebs Q4 with albuterol Q2 PRN and being able to space that uh, depending on how the patient does. You should also be thinking about switching them over to inhalers over nebs if they're able to inspire well. We'll talk more about the data behind that later. You can also treat with steroids. You can do PO or IV prednisone. 
40 milligrams for five days, or you can do IV methylpred, 60 to 125 milligrams, Q6 to 12 for three days if you're worried about a severe exacerbation. For antibiotics, azithromycin, 500 milligrams, PO once, and then 250 milligrams for two more days. If you're concerned about an underlying cap, you can also be treating with ceftriaxone versus something like levofloxacin. If there's risk factors for pseudomonas, uh, which having severe COPD is one of those risk factors, you can treat with much broader antibiotics, including piptazo or cefepime. You should be continuing the other patient's home medicines, and you should be monitoring them daily, uh, and you can be considering telemetry, getting daily CBCs and BMPs. If the patient has severe respiratory acidosis or has increased work of breathing, they should put on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And if the patient, despite this, is still having worsening hypercarbia or acidosis with a pH less than 7.26 as a general cutoff that you might be able to be worried about, they should be considered for mechanical innovation. Some pearls that you should be thinking about when admitting patients with COPD. Hyperoxia leads to decreased ventilation via the Haldane effect, and hypoxic con vasoconstriction leads to VQ mismatch and increased mortality. Now, that might not be exactly true, but that is the classical teaching and one of the things that you might be asked about on the wards. Home O2, if the SpO2 is less than 88% and quitting smoking are the only things that decrease mortality in the outpatient setting. Inhalers help reduce symptoms. Quitting smoking is still the best way to prevent or slow the progression of COPD. Antibiotics have been shown to reduce mortality and treatment failure. However, a Cochrane analysis suggests it helps in the ICU, but on the floor and in the outpatient setting, it's less clear which patients are going to benefit. But in general, at least in my experience, it seems to be something we treat most patients who come in with, especially if there's a concern that there's an underlying infection. For EKGs, things that you can see in COPD exacerbations include sinus tachycardia, right ventricular hypertrophy, P pulmonale, and a right bundle branch block. If you see emphysema in a young non-smoker, you should be thinking about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is an autosomal dominant deficiency of a protein protease inhibitor. Without it, there's uninhibited neutrophil elastase activity that leads to panacinar emphysema versus the central lobular emphysema that you see with smoking. Another tell will be that the patient has underlying liver disease. Some trials in literature. Previously, PO and IV prednisolone are the same in acute exacerbations of COPD, and 60 mg PO was not inferior to 60 mg IV when they followed the patients for 90 days. There was no difference in length of stay or early within two weeks or later treatment failure, which is why if the patient can take PO, we prefer it. The REDUCE trial showed that in acute exacerbations of COPD, five days of steroid treatment was not inferior to 14 days of steroid treatment when it comes to six months readmissions, and that was published in JAMA in 2013. The Cochrane analysis of nebulizers versus inhalers showed that it somewhat favors nebulizers over inhalers, but it's a pretty close. So in general, what you should do or be thinking about in an exacerbation in the inpatient setting is starting with nebs and quickly switching to inhalers since they probably deliver a more potent dose of the medicine. Inhalers also tend to be cheaper than nebulizers, they're less aerosolizing, and they're more portable. Titrating oxygen in COPD improves mortality, but hyperoxia makes it worse. Procalcitonin in COPD for the floor. Overall, there's low quality evidence, but it might lead to less antibiotics with similar outcomes in patients with acute exacerbations of COPD. And it's more used in the ICU for de-escalating antibiotics when you're already treating for a presumed in-hospital pneumonia. Vitamin D supplementation has been shown to reduce exacerbations. It can safely and substantially reduce the rate of moderate to severe COPD exacerbations in patients with baseline vitamin D levels less than 25, but not in those with higher levels. Pulse oximeters have about a three times frequency of occult hypoxemia that's not detected on the pulse ox in people of color when compared to white patients. This was published in the New England Journal Commentary. There's hidden hypoxia, and that's associated with worse outcomes, including in-hospital death, but not length of stay, regardless of your race. And it's shown in about 4.9% of white patients, 6.9% of black patients, and 6% of Hispanic patients and 4.9% in Asian patients. And that data was published in JAMA in 2020.
In general, I've noticed that at my institution, we're starting to consider 94% to be the cutoff with which we want to have it above so that we don't miss any occult hypoxia and don't have any systemic biases in our pulse oximeters in the hospital. So if you remember nothing else, acute exacerbations of COPD is a clinical diagnosis based on worsening dyspnea, cough, and sputum. You need to rule out congestive heart failure, pneumonia, pneumothorax, and PE as other common causes of hypoxia and respiratory distress, or at least be thinking about those. The most common cause of an exacerbation is a viral illness. You treat inpatient with duonebs, steroids, and antibiotics if needed. You should be watching for worsening hypercarbia and trial non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, but do not wait to intubate if needed. That's all for this episode. Check out pointofcaremedicine.com to see the templates we discussed, as well as the pearls, literature, and links to other resources.